today we heard from Ronnie Mitra uh, talking about uh, making decisions, and then uh, and one of the things Ronnie was talking about with domain driven design was that uh, a lot of his learnings have come up from a book he's written on microservices. And we've got the other co-author of the book here with us now, Arakli. Great to see you again. Hi. Hi, Mark. How are you? Can you hear me well? Yeah, yeah. So you're coming through perfect. Are you Fantastic. able to share your slide deck? Let's try it. It's always an adventure, right? <laughs> Can you see it? It'll be coming up shortly, I think. Not yet. <clears throat> Let me see. Um, so, uh, you, don't see, you don't see my no, screen? Not yet. I'll um, entertain the audience while you get um, this sorted. So, okay, yeah, great. Cool. And we've got the inception going. Okay, cool. Perfect. Okay. okay. And then if you can just click on the hide button at the bottom there so we can yeah okay wonderful uh, i'll leave i'll leave you oh that jumped you off okay cool i'll leave you to it thanks fantastic hi everybody thanks for the introduction um so my name is Arakli. i'm the vice president of core innovation at capital one capital one if you're not uh, familiar with it is a <clears throat> large financial institution in the united states it's i believe one of the top 10 largest banks and what I'm responsible there is uh, I'm responsible for the development of the core systems, which means um, these are kind of the most central systems, the uh, systems of record for account and transaction data that all other systems are built on top of. We build these systems in a cloud native manner. We use um, a lot of approaches that are microservices approaches for them. Uh, in the past, um, I have been building complex application using microservice architecture for a number of years now. Uh, prior to joining Capital One, I was CTO and co-founder of a successful healthcare startup uh, that we also built using microservices. And before that, I did consulting, advising some really exciting organizations and a number of government agencies globally about APIs and microservices. Uh, as Mark mentioned, I have written a couple of books about microservices. Um, a number of years ago, we wrote a book called Microservice um, Architecture that was more conceptual. Um, it covered a lot of topics of if you wanted to start adopting microservices in your organization and you were like one of the enterprise architects or uh, top executives, like what do you need to think about? Like what are all of the aspects that you need to consider? Uh, since then, a lot. this was published in 2016. Since then, as you know, many books have been published on this topic, fortunately, a lot of really good books. Uh, a lot of them uh, covered topics like various design patterns, uh, how to use microservices in various languages, like microservices for Java, microservices for Go. Um, one of the things that uh, Ronnie and I have been observing, however, continuing to adopt microservices at uh, different organizations, there was still, despite all of the books that were written, there was still lack of a hands-on guide, right? So, okay, I got all the conceptual stuff. I got all of the design patterns. I am actually building an application now in my organization. What do I do? There's some very specific choices and some very specific things that need to be done if you're actually building your services. Things like how do you organize your, um, your uh, teams? Things like um, how do you split microservices? Uh, so how, how do you split your larger application or your larger domain into smaller things? How do you even design microservices and APIs? What are the differences between APIs that you used to write and microservices? And we thought that um, none of the existing books really covered any of these topics end to end in a very like example step by step manner that would help practitioners really be able to like kind of touch and feel and uh, go through the journey with the book and get a much more uh, hands-on understanding of uh, what it looks like if you are to build a, a microservice architecture. So that's why we set up to um, write this new book um, aptly. It's called Microservices Up and Running. Uh, it was just published a week ago, as a matter of fact. 
And today what I would like to do is I would like to cover a, a topic from this book that I think is uh, very important. It has to do with um, designing um, APIs and microprocesses, uh, microservices once you do uh, embark on the journey of delivering a microservice architecture uh, system. And what we have found going through this with a, a number of teams at a num number of organizations is that it's very important to have a, a repeatable process for doing it, right? One of the uh, reasons you may want to adopt microservice architecture, it's and, and all of all of, everybody at this point knows that it's not a solution for all use cases. It's not a solution for everybody. But I think the way I would characterize it, it's a good solution if you have a complex enough a problem, right? So uh, it does bring a lot of complexity of its own. But if you do have a complex enough problem, which could be because it's maybe large enough or maybe it's um, uh, the, maybe other reasons uh, of the complexity, then microservices could help uh, in complex enough applications. But the thing about complex applications is that they're usually not developed by a small team, uh, let alone a single developer. So they're gonna have a lot of developers, very likely a lot of teams of developers. If all of them are designing services, whether it's a microservice or an API in a different way, uh, it can become very challenging, right? You can ha have a lot of inconsistency in quality approach choices. So we have employed in the projects that we have used um, a unified process that has ended up being very useful. And uh, we documented it in the book. I also wanted to talk to you about it today. Uh, we called it uh, Seven Essential Evolutions of Design for Services. It's a mouthful, obviously, but it uh, shortens to um, very cool seeds method, right? And we like this uh, abbreviation because we really think uh, this is really like a seeds for a plant. Like this method allows you to build services and APIs um, that will be uh, consistent, will be well designed, will consistently uh, take you to a good result. There are seven steps uh, as noted in the title. Uh, the first step is identifying the actors for your service. And when we say service, we really mean either API or microservice. You will be building both of those when building an actual system. The distinguishing um, characteristic we have for APIs versus microservices, because microservices in many ways are also technically APIs. The way we distinguish them is um, if you're writing it so that you can implement the functionality, then it's a microservice. If you're writing it so that an outside party, a consumer of your system has an interface with which it works, then that's an API. So that, that's the kind of distinction we draw, but in both ways, you can use this methodology. We first identify the actors, then we identify jobs to be done. Next, we identify the interaction patterns, um, next, through interaction patterns, we um, derive actions and queries. We uh, design a standard spec, usually an open API spec, if it's a RESTful API. We get feedback and then we implement the code. So let's look a little bit about uh, into each one of those. Um, the first step, very importantly, is identifying the actors. And the main motivation for starting the modeling of APIs and services with the definition of actors is to aid in scoping and prioritization, right? What is our service supposed to do is a very important question. And who is it, uh, uh, who is it um, intended for? Um, it's important because uh, through many years of working with API designers, a typical plague of API and service design that we have found in our industry is over abstraction. It's an over abstraction and lack of clarity regarding user needs. Too many APIs are just simply crude exposures of some database tables over HTTP or uh, graphs over HTTP or an attempt to provide direct, direct network access into application internals via say gRPC, right? So it's basically a, a function call over a network. Um, I wanna sound very uh, judgmental, but uh, in reality, like just to be blunt, such lazy and primitive approach to service design is seldom successful, 
right? You, you end up with cumbersome API designs that don't really serve the needs of the user. So instead, we start with the identification of actors. So we're going to walk through this example using um, a, um, the imaginary application that deals with uh, digital coins, right? So the digital coins have been uh, very devalued for a number of years, but are hot again. So let's uh, look at the like an imaginary digital wallet application that you would be building APIs for. So who, who would be actors in such an application? Like some of the actors you can imagine are maybe the Digicoin customer, right? The user using this wallet to purchase or exchange digital coins. Uh, the wallet itself, the platform, and the Digicoin application that is, let's say, a mobile application. Next, we need to identify the jobs that um, these actors uh, need to get done, right? And this comes from a really great uh, book, uh, Innovator's Dilemma by Clayton Christensen. It's a whole um, theory about how to design good uh, products. Uh, many of you have probably heard that the best way to design APIs is to treat them as uh, products. Uh, so how do you design a good product? You've got to understand what are the jobs that people are trying to get done uh, using your product. And similarly, if you're designing um, a customer-centric API or a service, you do want to understand what will be people doing with it. Uh, we have a standard template that we suggest for identifying jobs. Uh, it is inspired by Paul Adams' uh, uh, job-to-be-done story template, and there's a link um, uh, on this slide, if you want to look, read more about it. But basically, it goes as uh, when a circumstance, I want to, and you name the motivation, so I can, and you name the goal. You probably see some similarities between this and Agile stories. The, diff the big difference between this and Scrum stories is that we put emphasis on the circumstance, not on the uh, uh, user role or the actor. Right, the circumstance um, in which uh, something is needed is very important. So let's see some examples from the Digicoin. So some of the jobs to be done for the actors that we identified would be when a customer wants to buy coins, they want to see current price of a coin so that they can estimate their buying power. Right, so makes sense. This is what's, uh, what you would want to be able to do on this platform. Or another would be when a customer initiates a coin purchase, they need to add or reuse a payment method so that they can provide funds for the purchase. Again, makes sense. The value of the jobs to be done in the API design process is that these are very customer driven. Like you can literally go talk to your customers, go to subject matter experts in your organization, business users, and they will tell you what these jobs are. Like they're not technical, they're not intimidating, there's no XML, JSON, or YAML involved in it. This can be derived directly from talking to your customers and understanding their needs. However, um, once you have that, the next thing that you want to probably understand are interactions between the customers. Okay, they have the needs, but what is the sequence in which these needs are exhibited, right? What are the interaction patterns that um, you may observe in the system. Um, I know that UML is a little bit of an archaic um, system at this point, but it's a standard. It's something that many people are very familiar with. So you can use whatever uh, tool you want to uh, design your interactions, but one of them could be UML sequence diagrams because of familiarity and tooling. And another thing that we like about sequence diagrams that at this point, there are uh, text-based um, uh, markup languages that you can use. You don't have to draw anything in any graphical interface. So on the left, you can see a, a markup language called, um, uh, it's basically a UML uh, markup language that you can basically describe in text what is going on and it will automatically render um, that interaction for you. The great thing about the text is that you can check it into GitHub, you can uh, see the diffs, um, but the basic idea is whatever you use, make sure that you understand the interactions, that it's not a flat list of just jobs to be done. Once you understand the interactions and you have the jobs, you want to create something that's a little bit more technical, that can be used by your technologies, your developers, 
to actually start designing the APIs. And jobs are a little bit too uh, business language driven, right? They're not as um, tailored to designing APIs off of them. So we recommend to use the uh, interaction diagram and jobs to be done to create a list of what we call queries and actions. Queries are basically lookups with defined inputs and outputs. You ask a question, you get an answer, and you're defining what are the fields of the question, what are the elements that you're providing in the uh, um, question, and you're defining what are the fields, what are the elements that you expect to have in the answer and the output. So that's the query. It's uh, It doesn't mutate any state. It has no side effects, as uh, database um, practitioners like to say. Actions, in contrast, are requests to cause some change in the system, right? It's not about asking questions. You want the state of the system to actually change. And similarly to queries, you want to define the contract for these changes. You want to define the inputs and the expected outcome as well as the expected response. So what would be the examples of queries and um, queries for the DigiCoin application? So it could be something like, look up a coin price, and the input fields would be the idea of the digital coin, right? So is it a Bitcoin, is it a Litecoin, like what kind of coin it is? And the traditional currency code, like do you want uh, the conversion into uh, United States dollars or euros or some other currency? And the response should be the conversion rate. So you get, you get the idea of like what a query looks like, what the definition of a query is. And then for the actions, it would be, um, let's say, charge a payment method to fund coin purchase. Like you identify the coin you want to buy, so go ahead and buy it, right? And the input would be uh, the identifier of your payment method. So maybe you're using PayPal for it, right? So some kind of identifier for your PayPal um, uh, account, uh, amount that you want to buy, and the currency that you're paying. And the expected outcome would be success or the failure. Uh, hopefully the success and response will be the indicator whether it was success or the failure. That's how you define queries and actions. Ideally, you want to identify all of the queries and actions that are pertinent to your jobs to be done and your interactions. Once you have the queries and actions, if you have ever worked with like, let's say open API specification for RESTful APIs, it becomes almost trivial. It becomes so easy to translate them into a standard API specification, right? Because you have all of the inputs, you have all of the outputs, you really understand what your design is shaping up as at this point. So you can design one of the uh, standard specification. It can be GraphQL, it can be open API spec. Most people are still writing RESTful APIs where open API makes sense. And you can quickly produce something that's well-designed, that's documented, that can be interacted with. And it's important because the next thing you want to do before you start coding, you want to get the feedback, right? So far, you have done a lot of design to understand the problem, to get to the best design you can possibly produce, but the design is never done until you can get the feedback from the actual people who will be using your design, right? You should never get into the coding until you're able to give it to mobile developers, web developers, outside developers that will be actually using the API to see if it actually is solving their problems and how usable they find the API. Like you will save a lot of headache and a lot of time if you don't rush into the coding and do not omit this very important step of getting the feedback from like paper prototypes, from open API spec, from the people that will be actually using your API. And only then you should start coding, right? Once you have gone through these steps, the last step of your API design, okay, now you have a very good understanding of what your API should be. Go ahead, start coding, start deploying WebAssembly, Kubernetes, Go, Java, however you want to implement it. But the initial seven ste six steps leading to this seven step will save you a lot of headache and will lead you to a much better designed APIs and microservices. And this process will also be very repeatable because you're basically going through the same steps, avoiding accidental skipping of any step. So that's basically the uh, design process that we wanted to uh, introduce to you today. Like I said, 
It's one of the chapters in our book, Microservices Up and Running, that is now available both in print and digital. And I hope that uh, you will find this process useful in your own design of the APIs, as well as if you do decide to read the book, other things in the book useful in your own journeys of building great APIs and great microservices. Thanks, Arakli. That's fantastic. Ju, can you put up just for a sec your, um, again, the uh, contact slide of how people can follow up with you? I think it was at the start. Yeah. Come on. Um, the... Yeah, I'm most easily contactable um, through Twitter. So Great. it's another way. So uh, feel free to contact me there. We'd love to continue the conversations there. The, the interesting thing about the methodology is it's not, uh, it, it's agnostic on the type of API architecture or the API styles as well. So you could use this for um, gRPC, for, um, uh, for GraphQL, for REST, or it, it's, that's not, it's agnostic of all of that. It's just good Correct. methodology, yeah? Correct. Yeah, it, it's not uh, it's not dependent whether you want to use GraphQL or uh, REST or, um, uh, or gRPC or any other methodology. What about the um, uh, where do you find that there's the rush to sort of skip over one of those steps in the model that you uh, talked through? Is there any is there any blind spots that the you see is more common than the others as far as like um, people not people in the rush to want to sort of start implementing or building something that they don't do one of the stages of planning? Is there anything in particular? Uh, it's a wonderful question. It's a really great question. I think that uh, it's really a combination of things, right? Uh, it starts all the way from misunderstanding of test-driven development that unfortunately has pushed a lot of people into I jump into writing code without even thinking what I'm building here, right? Which was never, never the intention of test-driven development, right? But unfortunately, it has created uh, a little bit of that culture, uh, as well as uh, it was never the intention of Agile to say that skip all design and skip all considerations and jump into the coding, uh, but it has led to that. It, it's a little bit of that, and it's also a little bit of, um, there is still, a lot, of, a lot has been said about it, but unfortunately there is still the lack of understanding that APIs are the interfaces into your system and they need to be designed. Like a lot is still, a lot of teams unfortunately still uh, treat APIs as, okay, I have a database. I don't want to give direct access to my database to people. So I need to create this like thing that will do that over the network. And um, my pet peeve is, um, tools that like generate APIs from your database because that completely skips any kind of design um, process. But it's, it's a combination of things. It's a combination. So then from what you're saying though, two of the key things in your, so there's that really simple, like instead of getting caught up in design thinking too much, you know, which uh, it's fascinating and it's fun to get your head around. But if you need some shortcuts, that JTBD, template that you gave is a really simple bomb straight away you know what are you so there's that and then also from the sounds of what you're saying the whole open api specification like actually map out the specification of your api as well as far as like them being because then you can then that makes the testing easier later down the track all of that sort of stuff is that yeah, right that, that allows you to give people access to what you have designed even before you write code and get get feedback quickly. I think the interactions are also important, right? Sometimes we feel that APIs are kind of the static flat list of stuff, but they actually have interdependencies and there's usually a workflow, how different APIs and how different endpoints even uh, tie to each other, right? So it's very important to understand the workflow, the interactions between endpoints, not just the list of the endpoints. Well, wow. okay, great. Yeah. Um, and hopefully with things like, you know, event-driven architecture, there is more yeah. interest in thinking about that sort of stuff. Thank you so much. Uh, you. It's a real privilege to have you here, um, the co-author of Microservices Up and Running. Check Thanks it out. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Thanks. everybody.